Good evening. I think we've given people a couple of minutes to get here, although, as we all know with our recent storms, uh, that we expect some stragglers and unfortunately others have had, although they planned to attend, to send their regrets just simply because of issues like school closings or childcare. This has been our third Northeaster in about 10 days. So for those of you who are here, I commend you. And for those of you who will be viewing this video on our website in the future, uh, I'll console you with what a great talk you will have missed, but will contain uh, some things in the posted version that you should find of interest. It's my great honor to present to you Professor M. R. Rajagopal, who is known as the father of palliative care in India and has extended his beneficial influence throughout the globe. Uh, it's heartwarming to know that he began his medical career as an anesthesiologist and in fact achieved a, a marked level, level of success being department chair in that area. And then on a personal note, discovered that when a neighbor of his was crying because of unrelieved pain due to cancer, there were very few mechanisms available to get that life-promoting medication to the patient who really needed it. And so I'm going to keep my comments very short. There is almost no award I can think of, either in India or internationally, that Professor Rajagopal has not either won or been nominated for. And on that basis, we were extremely fortunate to learn that a new film, which focuses on his work called Hippocratic, was available for showing. And we were able to um, get him, as part of his North American tour, to come here, introduce the film, and then handle Q&A afterwards. You'll notice I'm carrying two things, and these will be my last minute. One is the wonderful book, The Global Pain Crisis, by a distinguished member of the audience which highlights his work specifically. And the other is something called the Modern Physician's Oath. The reason I wanted to call that to your attention is that over 100 medical schools have adopted an updated version of the Hippocratic Oath that accommodates measures uh, that we often take nowadays that were not available, such as prolonging life and how to deal with the ethics of that, or even the ability to take away a life. So, we are very honored that the author of that updated Hippocratic Oath used to work in this very building. That was the late Dean Louis Lasagna, who was a remarkable person and whose enduring influence we continue to benefit from. So with those abbreviated comments, and they really are abbreviated, I'm going to introduce Professor Raj, Raj Gopal to the podium and ask Raj um, to begin his introduction. So let's welcome Professor Raja Gopal to the podium. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for braving the snow and to be here with us. Uh, I stand here on behalf of the uh, two producers of this film, uh, Mike Hill and his wife, Sue Hill, uh, they run the Moonshine films, Moonshine movies in Aust Melbourne, Australia. They do f make many films as part of their business, but uh, purely out of their commitment, they keep on making uh, movies based on palliative care, just for advocacy for palliative care. Uh, his uh, the first major one was life before death then he produced little stars based on palliative care for children and then he wanted to make one specifically aimed at palliative care in the developing world and he chose to show the developing countries issues through me you making use of me as the medium that was my stroke of luck. Uh, Mike used to travel for these uh, premieres, but he could not be here. So he wanted me to greet you on his behalf and his wife. Thank you for uh, watching the movie. And what I'll do is I'll 
not make any speech now but after the movie i'll come back here with plan and maybe if there are any questions we can answer that there will, would still be time so dan with those words shall we get the movie going thank you very much doctors have to care this is what palliative care is about but Hello. i truly believe that this is what healthcare as a whole should be about It's about building lives not about destroying lives in the developing world the profit making industry goes unchecked the way medical science is progressing there is a tendency for doctors to be human machines diagnosing diseases and attacking the disease somewhere medical practice lost a bit of the heart it's all brain no? as a medical student i did not see a lot of compassion around me there was a lot of suffering it's a huge privilege that comes to a tiny minority of human beings to influence others as much as a doctor or nurse can as a school boy i read mahatma gandhi which i think had a huge influence on me there's a marginalized section of the society a large chunk of the society about who nobody seems to bother about and he reminds me not to forget me medicine has to refocus and concentrate on the quality of life of our patients and families i swear to fulfill to the best of my ability and judgment this covenant the hippocratic oath asked me to treat my patient with warm sympathy and understand once we are able to practice it we are able to make the hippocratic oath come alive it lives then it doesn't live till then And I have to say how touched I am that many of you came here, the travel we knew was terrible, we had all these storms, but you braved it all and, and rearranged your schedules. And we see a lot of the great students and graduates and faculty and friends of our pain research, education and policy program. So I would like to open the floor to Q&A, unless if, if Raj would want to make supplemental statements first, or perhaps people have some questions. Uh, Heather. That was a wonderful film and a real testament to your incredible career. Uh, not to mention an amazing travelogue for India. <laughs> I feel like I've been, but would really like to go. Um, I may not have the quotation exactly correct, but I believe you said that your system uh, for delivering palliative care fit the cultural values like a glove. Low cost, keeping patients at home, I'm trying to visualize a culture where that wouldn't fit like a glove. Um, and perhaps you could make some um, comparisons as a result of your travels about how palliative care services can best be delivered across different cultures. Uh, thank you for the question. I must admit that I have worked only in India. I know so little about the other country, so if I assume to draw comparisons, maybe that would be, uh, that would be rash. Having said that, I find, thank you for that, for making that suggestion. Somewhere inside me, I do feel that allowing people to be part of the community, even when they are ill, and allowing the community to lend a hand is something precious that is happening in our place. I do believe that someday 
this has to happen everywhere when i said low cost and suited to our realities cultural background and suited to our realities what i mean is we do not have a lot of money and generally even today though it's dwindling the extended family system is still there that makes it easy for us in a way and then we realized that gradually as the community is dwindling as young men are flying away and working elsewhere and we and our villages become more villages of the elderly people and women and children alone what is going to happen tomorrow well what the big advantage of the service that we provide is that we encourage the community to participate in every village that we go to you saw them in the movies though maybe it was not verbalized local volunteers are coming in compassionate communities are evolving i sometimes when i visit your hospices i wonder are there a lot of very lonely people there excellent facilities and if the patient rings a bell a nurse would be there but the nurse doesn't stay there all the time can she the lonely people are there in the hospices there are also lonely people outside in in their own homes and somehow if the community can help people to share that loneliness maybe what we do would be relevant elsewhere also but that's only a hypothesis Professor Garlick. Thank you. Uh, so my question, first of all, thank you for the um, inspiring movie. And for, uh, I, I've seen many of these quotes from Gandhi before, but I never really understood them because I never saw an example of them and how they come to life. So now I understand them in a very different way. And thank you to Dr. Carr and his colleagues for bringing you here and for enlightening us about these topics. So, so my question is, I, I didn't hear anything mentioned in, in the film about how to integrate the patient's spiritual and religious beliefs and practices into the cycle of care. Clearly these topics touch on very personal beliefs that deal in realms of religious practice and spirituality. So I'm interested in hearing how your team approaches individuals based and meeting them where they are in terms of their uh spiritual and religious religious practices that impact um these circumstances thank you a very profound question uh and i'll convey your congratulations to mike hill and sue hill uh we live in a multi religious society in kerala you know 51% of the population is hindu 22 christian 23 muslim generally we get along well together but we have to take care of those sensibilities i sometimes see that spirituality is too often associated with religious beliefs and rituals and we wonder whether that is that's necessary we allow people to have their own practices and sometimes we get the person in touch with the religious uh, elder leaders and if a patient a christian patient needs holy communion we facilitates that facilitate that but our own spiritual support would be connecting the person with what he has been connected all his life which may be god and religion but it may also be the environment his village taking him out and putting him in that 20 story corporate hospital disconnecting him totally from the world so maybe god maybe religion maybe just the environment the family that is part of the spiritual support i feel and it's also trying to find out what gives meaning to that person's life and trying to give a purpose to life trying to make that life meaningful one of my patients who 
had some trouble acknowledging to himself that he had incurable cancer, he eventually came to that acceptance. And when asked, is there something specific that you would like to do now? He was trying to decide between more chemotherapy or not chemotherapy. So I said, whether you have chemotherapy or not, now that you are feeling physically reasonably okay with the morphine, is there something that specifically that you would want to do? The man had had only primary education. But he said, I want to go to my primary school on small. It was quite far away, but I, we persuaded the family to take him. So he went back on a Sunday to see the school, wandered around the old classrooms, go, went to that small stream where they used to wash their plates after lunch. He just spent some time there, then he felt tired, he returned, and on his way back, he said, I feel at peace now. I think that's the connection that I'm talking about. And a lot of people would want to go back to a particular temple, or a particular, want to see a particular religious leader. That's also part of it. Thank you. Several questions, so first up in the front, Judy Foreman, uh, and then, then afterwards towards the back. Oh, a question for Dan Carr. Um, this is much less lofty in a way, but... Um, That's why it's for me. <laughs> That's why it's from me. Um, what could any of us do to help make it more likely that Dr. Rajagopal would win a Nobel Prize? Um, not just for him because he eminently deserves it, but it would also give a chance to get more publicity and attention to the problem of pain anyway. In other words, you want me to tell you what I learned from my being a runner-up? Yes, no. exactly. <laughs> uh, you you know, should I don't, be too, actually. No, I don't have any uh, insight into that political process. Uh, so I guess step number one is develop insight into the political process. I know that there are individuals who if they are winners, they get to nominate subsequently and vote. And I've actually met, it actually was an anesthesiologist from Sweden, uh, perhaps Roman has heard him talk, who was on the Nobel Selection Committee. He, uh, after he left that position where he had to be confidential, he was then able to make the rounds and circuit talking about his experiences. I think it was Sten Lindahl who was the uh, selector for the Nobel Committee. So step number one is try to understand more about the politics and who gets to vote. Um, I would think that there actually should be a, a relatively easy multiplier effect given how many networks involve people who are interested in hospice and palliative care. I don't know that it's a democracy. I'm not at the end of the day. I mean, they've also in their course of Nobel Prize uh, given them to things that decades later people look back and can't understand, like lobotomy, for instance. Um, or fever therapy. But I would think there are so many networks in place already to promote primary care and hospice that that would be a good place to start. So uh, it's a great question and, um, and I think it's doable because it really makes a wonderful statement. I, I don't know how others felt, but I felt watching the film that this was a breath of fresh air because our narrative about pain is dominated by opioids, which is dominated by blame and potential legal liability of lawsuits. Uh, but it, it seems to overlook the most fundamental and obvious facts of existence. So it, it's a great question to raise, and I hope it doesn't just end with my fumbling around for an answer now. There were a couple of other questions up in the back. Hello. Dr. Matthew and Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you behind Dr. Matthew. Sorry. Please go. No, no. Please go ahead first. Yeah. Um, hello. I'm Pavna. Um, so I have so many questions. Where should I start? So one. Um, thank you for all of your strong leadership in this field. Um, medicine is a lot of an apprenticeship, and I think what you see is what you learn. And having done medical school in India, where as you alluded to, you never saw the compassion. You never saw pain care, especially when it was there. I've grown up seeing lumbar punctures done without lidocaine, even when I asked them to have, when I gave them lidocaine, that let's use this, or doing 
amputations of feet without any pain control. How do you um, suggest we inculcate this in the medical education system at a very basic level? And how do we change that culture beyond just being the examinable topic? There is a statement in the question. Uh, just as uh, half a century back, I did not learn pain management. Even today, sadly, the medical student in India does not learn pain management. We had some success in changing a law. We had some success in government in creating a national government strategy on palliative care. But our most notable failure was in persuading the Medical Council of India to include palliative care in the curriculum. That has been a uh, sad uh, uh, omission on the part of the curriculum. And uh, we, our a body of people, pioneers, are trying to go through individual health universities and institutions, but that is such a small step. Your question remains unanswered. And uh, Medical Council of India is not known to be the most effective body at the government of India. That is sad. Unless there is that role modeling, things will not change. When we were functioning inside a medical college, we could see the enthusiasm with the, of the medical students. People were being changed but that's happening only in such a tiny handful of medical colleges in the country. May I add something? First of all, I want to re-express my admiration for all the students in our pain program and faculty who are here because they're all making some sacrifice to take the program and ultimately will be training the other trainers in their career. But without trying to put Dr. Bradshaw on the spot, Dr. Bradshaw is our academic director of the program and a dedicated career ed medical educator. I wonder if Dr. Bradshaw wanted to comment about challenges, difficulties, or reflections about pain. And then only because I see Pam Bressler ahead of her, and she's uh, close to Libby, and literally and figuratively, I wonder what they thought. Or if any of the students or faculty wanted to volunteer, join in the dialogue conversation. Thanks, Dan. I think uh, when we, th there are many routes to change. Uh, there's the demand side and the supply side, and they work together, uh, even in something like medical education. So the demand of students, the demand of patients, uh, is really helpful in terms of changing our medical system, and that's why students uh, hear um, from all of our different uh, schools and programs at Tufts uh, and maybe beyond um, are important in terms of thinking about pain because it's really uh, seeing that demand from, from students that allows faculty to think more broadly and to deliver more. Um, uh, it also comes from faculty wanting to do more and uh, as, as you have done so much already and you, I think one of the things that was wonderful in this film was really thinking about sort of the motivation that one gets from your patients as a clinician, the, the need of the patient. It's a demand in a way, but it's really a need. Um, and you, you built from that need of the individual and built your own skills and ability to supply the need that then reached across the country and even the world here now. Um, we have a lot to do in palliative care. We have a lot to do in pain. Um, clearly, uh, the emphasis on the social need uh, is, is important in balancing it, but it's also a need for medicines and for um, the, the support of families for people uh, with pain. So those are all the kinds of things that we learn from our patients. We learn from uh, one another, um, and it's, it's work uh, that I appreciate very much that you shared with us today. Thank you. We hear Rahul will get um, to you later, and we'll just continue.
Let's continue. And I see other hands too. I may not be able to see everyone, but let's, we'll, we'll just have a little conversation. It's a small enough group we can profit from that. Um, thank you. This was wonderful, insightful. Um, what I appreciated most was your emphasis on the isolation that can happen and how um, gracefully, artfully, you um, brought in the family, um, not just for the family's benefit, for the patient's benefit. And I think often when, and, and you mentioned this several times in the film, um, when we are in that technical world of, of medicine, often the connection um, disappears. Um, both for the clinician and for the family and for the patient. And so what I take from this is we have a lot of work to do with ourselves and our students to honor that and role model that and teach that. And where um, a patient finds meaning, we have to understand where that comes. And that's part of uh, good health care um, at any stage. So. Again, I appreciate your work and role modeling it for those of us here. Thank you. Thank you. May I just add, um, as somebody who is a protege of Professor Rajagopal, um, I'd like to, to say that what we've seen of India here is not necessarily representative of the realities of medical life. Whereas on the one hand you have this obscene dearth of opiates. Down the corridor in a private hospital you might get state-of-the-art state LVAD devices being put into patients. 80% of India um, or 80% of medical care in India is privatized. And if palliative care were a profitable entity within the private sector, I would argue that palliative care would be made available throughout India. The fact is that it costs a lot more to stick somebody in ICU when they're 95 years old with bilateral renal failure and bilateral pneumonias, to stick a tube in every orifice and intubate them so that the, a fat bill can be presented 10 days later when the patient dies to the family and then cater to this wonderful metric that all shareholders really value. And it is a fiduciary responsibility of the hospital to provide value to those shareholders. So when medicine becomes a commodity, which is what unfortunately it is in this country, what we can potentially do is to learn from how America has expanded medical care um, and potentially cross-subsidize the profit that we receive to patients who cannot afford it. And that's something we'd like to learn. Um, from countries with opiate excesses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer? Thank you so much. I really appreciated um, how your life has been built around dignity for life and how you showed that through you know, your decades of service. Um, and your major accomplishment at getting the 1985 law repealed, that's tremendous. Um, I've had very humble workings um, in India, I'm sorry, in, in uh, Haiti, trying to bring um, palliative medicine practices and pain medicine practices um, to uh, the southern part of the country. And I've hit barrier after barrier on on all sorts of levels. And like India, Haiti um, had for a long time has had a practice of not allowing opioids into the country uh, because of the fear of abuse and things that you talked about. Um, I'm just wondering if you, even though you haven't practiced outside of India, if you have any words of wisdom um, having worked in a developing country and trying to bring about this change as um, how to start to get inroads 
Um, is it with the government? Is it with the hospital? How did you get opioids when you had this huge shortage, um, but you were still using them? Um, things like that that are a tremendous frustration to those of us who are trying to do the same thing elsewhere. Um, like you, I also have many more questions than I have answers, but I have a partial answer to one question. True, we work with the bureaucracy. It's true, we work with the politicians. But they eventually listened to us when the public got interested. Because we engaged the community, because we developed a body of volunteers through the length and breadth of the state, which caused the media to give attention to this. When the public embraced us, then the bureaucracy was more willing to listen. So when I was foolish enough to go and talk to people and say, this is the right thing to do, it didn't receive any attention. And when the local population got interested, that made a difference. I, I really wish I had started working with the community more and engage the common man more, making him ask for a change. I don't know how difficult that is or how easy that is, but as we often say, it doesn't have to be easy. Sometimes difficult things are to be done if a change is to be effected. And coming back to your suggestion about role modeling, unfortunately, the role modeling given through the country is of high-tech medical interventions. And I am sad to see young medical graduates coming out truly believing that they have a duty to keep the heart beating at all costs, even if it destroys the family, even if it destroys the person physically and emotionally. They truly believe that's their duty. And so you and I have a lot of work to do in future. Uh, time for one last comment, and then uh, I'll leave it to Professor Raja Gopal as to how, if, if you would like to buy these, how best to do this. We have, he brought a number of the extra ones. So final question for now. Um, echoing your uh, statement on community engagement, um, what sort of lessons and strategies did you um, learn throughout your journey and the best ways to engage the community because I'm sure there must have been a, a lot of barriers in various ways. Mm, thank you. Uh, the first step is to step down the, from the pedestal that doctors very often stand on. Recognize that those people out there in the community who may be illiterate have a lot of strength in the, them and learn to respect them. And without that, they cannot be engaged. Once that happens, it's very important to have an active facilitator. The goodness in the community, the social capital is there. But we need that facilitation, which we do by having more of our social workers or doctors going out and doing awareness programs wherever we get a we get a platform. Public awareness programs are held. And if we do three, at least in one, someone will get up and say, this is important, we have to do it in this village. And then we engage, the, engage with that person and eventually a body of people develop who get together. Then we do volunteers training program for them. Currently what we do is three days of classroom sessions and three days of working in the field, shadowing the team. So once we get them that certificate of volunteers training, many of them come into the field. Some of them, especially retired people, retired from government service or whatever, uh, engage it in full time. I wish you would come and see them someday. They are truly inspiring. But some, even students and technocrats, come on Saturdays 
and help us and when our people on wheelchairs need to be mobilized they their homes usually do not have a road or wheelchair access college students come lift them up bring them out to the road and help them so there is a lot of goodness there which we have to nurture and they have to get get satisfaction from the work that we have to make sure we have to acknowledge their work and they have to be given respect thank you well let's close with a final round of uh, uh, i just oh, wanted yeah, to sorry. say on yeah. behalf of yeah. mike hill and so hill the producers they have sent with me several discs uh, so this is available for purchase at 25 dollars if anybody is willing chandrika is sitting there with a notebook and uh, we have them available thank you very much thank you very much Thanks.